In this video, I'm going to explain why different parts of the world have such different climates. In my previous video, I introduced the concept of the three-celled model of the Earth. I'm going to describe this in more detail, but just keep in mind it's not a perfect model. It's a really useful theoretical tool, but it's not perfect. Remember how we came up with this model. We used the fact that the equator is hotter than the poles and the Coriolis force. We didn't even think about continents, mountains, ocean currents, and many other things. So first I'll explain this model, and then I'll explain how the reality is much more complicated. We have three cells in each hemisphere, the Hadley cell, the Farrell cell, and the Polar cell. Between each cell, we have air that's either rising or falling. When air rises, it expands and it cools, and we get rain. When air falls, the opposite happens. It comes down as very dry air. When air rises, the air is being pulled away from the surface, so we have low surface pressure. When air is falling, the air is pressing down onto the surface, so we have high surface pressure. Rising air means rain and low pressure. Falling air means dry air and high pressure. Between the Hadley cells, we have air that's rising because the equator is so hot. This region is called the Intertropical Convergence Zone, or the ITCZ. The ITCZ is one of the wettest parts of the planet. This is where we have the tropical rainforests. Between the Hadley and Farrell cells, the air is falling. When air is falling, we have dry air and high pressure. This is called the subtropical high, and it's where we have many of the world's deserts. Between the feral and polar cells, we have the polar front. The polar front is a wet area with lots of storms. At the top of the polar cell, the air is coming down over the North Pole. Air coming down is very dry. Now the North Pole has plenty of ice and snow, but it's on the ground. It's rarely falling from the sky because the sky is so dry. So now we know where air is rising and falling. That tells us where there's high and low pressure and pressure differences cause wind. Imagine we have an area of low pressure. Wind moves from high pressure to low pressure. So at first, you might expect the wind to rush in from all sides. But remember the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force deflects the wind to the right in the northern hemisphere. So wherever you see wind, you'll see low pressure to the left of the wind and high pressure to the right. The Hadley cell has a low pressure zone to its south and the subtropical high to its north. In order to keep low pressure on the left side of the wind, the wind moves from east to west. These winds are called the trade winds. They're very useful if you want to sail from Europe to America. The Farrell cell has a low pressure zone to its north, so winds move in the opposite direction. They move from west to east. We normally describe winds by where they're coming from. These winds are coming from the west, so they're called the westerlies. In the polar cell, the winds move from east to west, so these are called the polar easterlies. I've now described the three-cell model of the Earth for the northern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere is much the same. It's a mirror image of the north. Now this is a nice theoretical model, but if you look at real-world data, you'll see that everything is way, way more complicated. The high and low pressure zones are not actually in these neat little bands across the Earth. They're in these blobs that are constantly moving around. One of the biggest problems with the three-celled model is continents. The model works pretty well in the Southern Hemisphere, where there aren't all these continents screwing everything up. Continents are different from oceans because land changes temperature more quickly than water and temperature differences lead to pressure differences. During the summer, the land gets really hot, the air starts rising, and this creates a low pressure zone. During the winter, it's the reverse. The land gets really cold, and this creates a high pressure zone. This is particularly noticeable in Central Asia. In the summer, it has low pressure. In the winter, it has high pressure. Let's use the three-celled model to explain what's going on in South America. South America is covered by the Hadley cell and the Farrell cell. Within the Hadley cell, the trade winds are moving from east to west. Within the Farrell cell, the westerlies are moving from west to east. South America has a long mountain range called the Andes. And remember, 
What happens when air rises over a mountain range? It rains. Within the Hadley cell, the air is moving from the east to the west, so the east side gets lots of rain, and the west side is a desert. Within the Farrell cell, the westerlies are moving from west to east, so the west side gets lots of rain, and the east side is a desert. Now let's look at the eastern United States. The eastern U.S. is almost the same latitude as the Sahara. But it's not dry, it's very wet. This is a result of ocean currents. The Coriolis force not only affects winds, it also affects oceans. Just as how the air moves clockwise in the northern hemisphere, so does the water. The water on the east coast is coming up from the equator and the Caribbean. The water on the west coast is coming down from Alaska. So the east coast water is much warmer than the west coast. And this is not just true for the United States, it's true on east coasts of many continents. So the water along the Atlantic coast in the Gulf of Mexico is very warm. This produces hot air that holds lots of water. And that keeps the eastern United States very green. Now there's one more complication to the three cell model that we need to talk about. The three cells are changing with the seasons. Remember how we came up with the three cell model. The sun was shining directly on the equator. The equator got really hot and the hot air began expanding and rising. But the angle of the sun changes over the course of a year as the Earth's axis moves. In June, the North Pole tilts towards the sun, bringing the North more sunlight. In June, the sun is not shining directly on the equator. It's shining directly on the Tropic of Cancer. Since the North is getting more sunlight, the ITCZ moves north. In December, the North Pole points away from the sun. Now the South gets more sunlight, and the ITCZ moves south. The ITCZ is constantly moving north and south over the tropics. Within the tropics, there's often a rainy season when the ITCZ is overhead, and a dry season when it's gone. The tropics are warm all year round, so seasons in the tropics mostly involve changes in rainfall, not changes in temperature. This is what happens in India. In the winter, the ITCZ is south of India, and so India is dry. But in the summer, the ITCZ moves north. It goes especially far north into India because there's a low pressure zone over Asia sucking it in. India is very wet in the summer, not only because the ITCZ is there, but also because the air is rising over the Himalayas. This causes the Indian monsoon which is famous for its wet summers and dry winters. Keep in mind that the seasons don't just affect the ITCZ. They affect all the cells. All the cells will shift north and south over the year. Now that we've covered all this background, I'm going to try to explain the main climate characteristics of each of the continents. In North America, warm ocean currents heat up the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic coast. This brings humid air to the eastern United States. As you go further north, the temperature changes more with the seasons. In the winter, northern Canada is very cold. The western U.S. gets its moisture from the Pacific, but the Pacific deposits most of the rain over the mountains of the Pacific Northwest, leaving the rest of the west pretty dry. And it's especially dry over Arizona and northern Mexico. There we have the subtropical high found in the three-celled model. There is also a high-pressure zone in the Pacific, just off the coast of California. This keeps California dry in the summer, but in the winter, it moves south, giving California a wet winter. In South America, the ITCZ is often found near the equator, and it brings lots of rain to the Amazon rainforest. The ITCZ shifts north and south over the year so that much of Central and South America has distinct rainy and dry seasons, as well as tropical temperatures throughout the year. Like North America, South America also has a humid east coast and a temperate zone which is found in Argentina and southern Brazil. Earlier, we saw that South America has deserts on both sides of the Andes, depending on which way the wind is blowing. Like South America, Africa also has a tropical rainforest, the Congo. And again, the ITCZ moves north and south, causing rainy and dry seasons around the tropics. This is where we find the African savanna. 
In the savanna, there are some trees and lots of grass. Grass is better suited to handle changes in rainfall. These moving rains also cause animals to move. The great wildebeest migration is a migration towards these moving rains. Warm ocean currents along the east coast give us a temperate zone in Southeast Africa. The three-celled model tells us that air is descending along the subtropical highs, giving us the Kalahari Desert, the Sahara Desert, and the Arabian Desert in the Middle East. The subtropical high over the Sahara also extends into the Mediterranean in the summer, but it moves south in the winter, giving the Mediterranean a wet winter and dry summer. The westerlies and the polar front bring lots of humid air and storms in from the Atlantic onto the British Isles and France. As you go further east, Europe gets drier. As you go further north, it gets colder. In Asia, the ITCC is often near the equator and brings lots of water to the rainforest of Indonesia. In the summer, the ITCC moves north and it brings monsoon rains to India and Southeast Asia. Ocean currents along the Pacific bring warm water to the east coast of China and Japan, producing a humid temperate zone. As you move further inland, you're getting further away from any sources of water. There we have the cold deserts of Central Asia, like the Gobi Desert. As you go north, Asia gets colder and colder as you head towards Siberia. In Australia, there is a subtropical high sitting over the continent, producing a very large desert. But on the east coast, there are ocean currents bringing in warm water and giving the east a humid temperate climate. That's where most Australians live. And New Zealand also has a temperate climate for similar reasons. Antarctica is very dry. In the summer, it's very cold. In the winter, it's extremely cold. For more astronomical videos, please click to subscribe. Mm, astronomical.